Welcome, Saeed, as well, our colleagues from the from the Tans team. Okay, <clears throat> I'll say, Paula, perhaps we can start uh, uh, just with the, at least with, with, with some of the introductions as, as colleagues keep, uh, you know, joining us today. Um, so my name is uh, Martina, Caterina, for those who don't know, know me yet, I'm the co-chair of the TANS team on law and policy under the Global Protection Cluster. Uh, together with my colleague uh, Fernando from the Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, and today um, we are here as part of this um, webinar, of course, as you all know, on um, legal aid to protect the right to legal identity. Um, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that we are organizing under a project of the task team on law and policy on legal aid in humanitarian settings. And uh, you will see now in the, in the chat, my colleague Mariana will actually share the link to the web page of the project where you can also find the other tools that we have developed over the past year and a half um, under this project, the legal aid analysis framework that comes accompanied with another couple of documents, a conceptual framework, uh, as well as an analysis guide. These are tools that we have developed and uh, we, we talked about it in, an, in different webinars and some of you are actually, some of you who are here today, like the colleagues in Iraq, are currently using them. Um, and so this is uh, ongoing work that we, we welcome and we're always there to, to support you, uh, if, uh, if you if it's something that you want to explore or it's something that you may need support with. Uh, on that page, you will also find the findings of a survey that we run a couple of yeah, now already, yes, a couple of years ago between one thing and the other. And that survey, actually, the, the results of these surveys around the um, challenges and lessons learned that you are facing in the field when looking at legal aid in humanitarian settings, this is really what also informed uh, this learning initiative, this series of webinars, and uh, which really aims at collecting good practices in some key areas. And, and we'll have the, the chance to hear from Paula and colleagues what these key areas are. Um, I will not repeat them now, but we'll, we will soon get to it. Um, as some of you might have seen already from the concept note that we have shared. Um, I just wanted also to flag before we start that we have already had, you know, the first webinar of this series looking at legal aid in a reparation context. And now Mariana will also share the link specifically for the recording of that webinar in case uh, it is something that, in case you missed it, and it is something that you're also um, interested in. So I'd say without taking any any more time from, from my side, I would like to introduce uh, Paola Barsanti. She is the consultant who's been working very closely with us on this project for the past year and a half, and she will take it from here. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. And, I sh and on that note, I'll take advantage just to say, please all, great. Uh, if you could all uh, mute yourself, I think there are going to be a good number of people, so that would be fantastic. Thanks so much, and Paula, to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Martina, and uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for making it today. Um, since we will not have time to do a tour de table to introduce ourselves, uh, let me just welcome uh, all of you. Um, today, the event brings together, as the other webinar back in February, a variety of experts, uh, I would say, and practitioners uh, on access to justice and legal aid in uh, humanitarian settings uh, from a variety of organizations, stakeholders and sectors. We have among us um, representatives from UN agencies and international organizations such as UNDP, UNHCR, uh, IOM, UNODC, the High Commission for Human Rights and others. 
uh, colleague, um, we have a representative from INGO um, specialized on protection and legal aid and access to justice, such as I can see definitely colleagues from uh, DRC, NRC, uh, IRC, IEDLO and others. Uh, we have members of the national uh, uh, legal aid civil society uh, around the globe and representative from academia uh, and uh, uh, research uh, institutes. Um, uh, we also welcome representatives from uh, government and donors who are supporting this initiative of uh, legal aid in humanitarian setting project within the task team on law and policy uh, and other donors who are joining us today that are uh, usually uh, financing or providing technical and political support to uh, legal aid and access to justice programs. Uh, so to all of you, uh, welcome and a good morning and good afternoon for the colleagues uh, uh, on the other side. Um, the objective uh, of the webinar today, as uh, Martina mentioned, is uh, learning. So uh, listening and hearing from our fantastic uh, uh, panelists and speakers, uh, but also exchange on good practices and lessons learned on legal aid program to protect uh, legal identity. Um, you, as you all know, uh, legal identity is the key to exist before the law, but also to access and enjoy uh, rights, to prove a family lineage and also to prevent a risk of statelessness. Um, normally, uh, in crisis and humanitarian settings, uh, civil registration systems become poorly operational, state a duty bearer face challenges in ensuring that all the uh, residents in their uh, territories actually uh, are recognized as individuals before the, the, uh, the, the law and can access justice. In particular, displaced population face uh, a number of variety of obstacles to renew, update, recover, safeguard their legal and civil documentation and credentials. Uh, obstacles we will hear from uh, the panelists uh, are vary between country, but can include cost, discrimination, social practices, bureaucratic uh, uh, obstacles, but also lack of information and awareness on procedures and requirements uh, to uh, renew and recover legal and civil documentation that have been maybe lost or damaged during the conflict or the disaster. Legal aid and access to justice program are normally put in place by international and national uh, civil society and other actors to support state's obligation uh, to uh, register all people residing in their territories, but also to support directly displaced population or people in need to approach uh, uh, institutions and register their vital events. Uh, today, we are going to hear from colleagues working in uh, Myanmar and Syria. Uh, as uh, um, uh, we did uh, in the first uh, webinar back in, uh, in February, uh, thanks to the field colleagues, we discussed and chose two countries. Uh, in the first webinar, we had chosen Colombia and Ukraine as uh, yet very different from each other. They presented some similarities in terms of, of being laboratory for transitional justice measures to restore um, uh, the rights of those who suffered the human rights violation during conflict. Today, uh, colleagues from the field and uh, uh, the task team on law and policy expert suggested to, to have Syria and Myanmar as a country case study uh, as they uh, present similar uh, again, uh, every country and every context is special, but they present some similar characteristics in terms of uh, challenges faced by um, displaced population in accessing their rights to legal identity. 
among other restricted access to population in needs, uh, uh, risk of statelessness for some categories, and limited ability with work to work with uh, legal aid national actors being uh, duty bearers or uh, national civil society. Uh, the panelists today will give us then for an overview of the challenges they face, but most importantly, they're going to share with us uh, some innovative practices uh, that they put in place together uh, in their country context uh, to overcome those challenges. We hope uh, that while uh, uh, listening to our speakers, we can all reflect among um, each other on ch similar challenges that are faced in the country you're working on and maybe share uh, other experiences or um, ask follow-up questions to our panelists. Uh, as, uh, as mentioned, the idea is to learn and exchange, so uh, don't be shy and um, feel free to ask follow-up questions either in the chat or during the section on uh, question and answer. As you can see from uh, the slide, thank you, Mariana. Um, we have representatives from uh, uh, UNHCR, uh, from UNDP, and from International Legal Foundation that will present on uh, Myanmar case study. And we will have a representative uh, from UNDP, UNHCR, and Regional Refugee Council that will present on the Syria um, uh, case study. We will have at the end of the discussion, uh, at the end of the presentation, a space for uh, for question and answer. I will um, just uh, before uh, uh, um, starting the the, uh, the discussion with the, the panelists, I will ask you, uh, please, uh, if you could uh, mute uh, your microphone, especially when the speakers are uh, presenting, so they, they can focus the attention on their presentation. Uh, feel free to write questions uh, in the chat the, directly, and uh, we will then open up the floor for uh, more exchange. Uh, and to the panelists, a special thanks because uh, as uh, um, on top of their responsibilities and their uh, hard workloads, they actually put effort in presenting their intervention and uh, in complementing each other uh, during this presentation. So thanks in advance for all the work done on this. We are very grateful. So uh, the topic is, uh, is very clear. Uh, now we're going to look at the topic of protect uh, uh, legal identity through three lenses that you can you can see on the on the screen. These three aspects have been again uh, uh, the result of a broad consultation with uh, uh, protection and legal aid practitioners from around the world uh, through the survey that Martina mentioned. And uh, these are the three aspects on which they asked uh, to share uh, good practices and lessons learned on coordination, partnership and uh, strategies to respond to population uh, hard to reach. Uh, so without uh, further delay, I will uh, ask the first question um, to uh, both uh, um, country uh, uh, case study representative, uh, starting from uh, Myanmar. Uh, so I will uh, uh, give the floor to uh, Masha first. Um, so the question is about coordination. And in particular, uh, if, you, if you want, Mariana, you can keep the slides on the question. So maybe that's uh, um, clear for participants. Um, the first uh, question is uh, uh, as UNHCR and then uh, uh, Jose uh, as UNDP, how um, have uh, humanitarian development, human rights and peace actor coordinated their efforts to implement more effective and collaborative legal aid and access to justice intervention to secure uh, legal identity of displaced population in Myanmar. Thank you, Marcia. Hello, colleagues. Uh, my name is Maria Voloshkevich, and I am statelessness officer uh, with UNHCR based in Yangon. I'm uh, very pleased to be part of this um, event today and wishing us um, all a very fruitful discussion. 
Um, Myanmar uh, is facing one of the most complex and longest standing humanitarian crises in Southeast Asia. We continue to witness intensified conflict involving a multitude of actors and diminishing humanitarian space. In addition to almost 2 million people displaced due to conflict, Myanmar hosts one of the largest stateless populations in the world. There are over 600,000 uh, stateless Rohingya, in addition to over 11 million people who have no proof of legal identity in the country. Historically, the issues of citizenship, ethnicity, and political affiliation are closely interlinked in this country. And systemic discrimination of ethnic and religious minorities in laws and practice is a root cause of exclusion of large group of population from rights and opportunities. Uh, in, uh, in addition with uh, systemic corruption and common practices of extortion, this makes um, the, um, um, these populations particularly vulnerable. The issues of citizenship are highly politicized and sensitive, and the legal aid is also increasingly politicized, putting at risk the safety uh, of service providers. This leaves us with very limited number of organizations and people willing and able to work in this area. So to ensure there is a link and um, some sort of connection between these existing uh, legal aid organizations working towards improving access to legal identity in different parts of the country, UNHCR jointly with um, Norwegian Refugee Council launched a citizenship network to offer a platform for relevant service providers to exchange information, experiences, and lessons learned to coordinate activities, um, harmonize awareness raising messages and um, advocacy, uh, conduct capacity building of networks members, and um, joint planning on advancing activities towards addressing statelessness. Another uh, successful example of um, um, cooperation um, is with um, UNICEF. Last year uh, in Rakhine State, uh, which is a home to um, a stateless Rohingya population, UNHCR jointly with UNICEF uh, conducted a series of consultations with humanitarian and development actors with the aim to develop a joint strategy and an operational work plan on improving access to birth registration. Since there are many limitations to what can be practically achieved within this uh, complex and sensitive environment, we aimed to develop a working plan that is feasible and realistically achiev achievable within a short um, period of time, because planning for a long term is very difficult. So the um, um, work plan for this year includes activities aimed at raising awareness on the importance of obtaining citizenship and civil documentation, enhancing people's understanding on the procedures and processes to file applications for birth registration and citizenship, and um, also aims at harmonization of data collection on documentation among uh, relevant stakeholders and synchronization of advocacy messages. And here, uh, let me pass word to my colleague Steph, who is based in Rakhine State, who has been able to join the session despite severe crash on the Rakhine region by the extremely severe cyclone last weekend. Steph, over to you. Thanks, Masha. I'm just going to quickly switch on my camera. I'm Steph. I'm the protection officer here in central Rakhine State. Um, and just building, I'm just going to switch on the switch off the camera now because of the bandwidth. Um, just building on what Masha has said and, and just reflecting back to the stateless uh, population and how Rakhine has one of the largest stateless population um, here in um, uh, stateless population in the world. Um, uh, in terms of from, from a protection cluster and looking at synergies and coordination. Um, we try to look at um, uh, synergies and try to look at um, providing support in the context of legal identity through coordination mechanisms. And one of it is in thematic areas, looking at detention and also irregular movement. Um, now, because this population, especially the Rohingya, they are subjected to discrimination and um, they, they do not have proper identification or legal identity. 
Uh, many of them get charged, many of them get arrested, many of them get detained um, under the Immigration Act and also the Registration Act. Um, in 2022 itself, we recorded about 3,000 uh, Rohingyas who have been detained for irregular movement, and uh, 2,000 of them were actually sentenced. Out of the 2,000 that were sentenced, 400 were actually children, and looking at detention and irregular movement initiatives and referral pathways was one of the priorities for the protection cluster to ensure that identification and response are actually given to uh, these individuals uh, who are detained because they do not have legal documentation. Now, um, the protection cluster continues to work on an SOP, um, which is uh, coordinated through different UN agencies, including UNICEF, um, UNFPA, UNHCR, um, and it is also coordinated with ICRC and other protection cluster partners who are also legal and non-legal um, protection cluster partners. This is with the intent to look at a holistic sort of referrals um, a pathway and services. And um, part of um, recognizing that we have very limited services here in Rakhine, but we try to see how we can actually capitalize on legal services on the ground, restoring family links and any material support that partners are actually able to give. Um, now, linked to lack of civil documentation and um, freedom of movement comes, and Masha has already touched upon this, is extortion. Uh, many of Rohingyas are subjected to extortion and through protection cluster tools like protection incident monitoring systems, um, through general monitoring and as well as uh, through monitoring framework exercise that the cluster has rolled out, um, we have come to see that 80% of uh, the victims of extortion here in Rakhine are actually Rohingyas. Um, and they are, are victims of extortion due to um, perpetrated by legal actors, non-legal actors, and a lot of it is also linked to access to civil documentation, part of access to services and civil documentation. Um, so the cluster that um, through, through evidence-based uh, exercise, um, they've developed a counter-extortion strategy and also harmonized um, uh, advocacy messaging as it relates to access to civil documentation and messaging have uh, these messagings have been endorsed through the protect uh, sorry the inter the ICCG um, and it's been used uh, through the protection cluster members as well um, in terms of another actor in Masha's touch or pawn with UNICEF and maybe this would segue into Jose's um, a part as well um, is coordination through uh, with UNDP, and this is very much to create an enabling framework here in Rakhine because um, it's not just legal identity in name, but also creating a sense of belonging and ensuring that there is a cohesion um, between displaced population, Rohingya displaced population, non-displaced population, and with host communities. Um, this is done through the Triple Nexus Initiative, and uh, particularly in central Rakhine, we are looking at joint needs assessments um, to be done on an area-based approach and trying to look at livelihoods and development initiatives through this needs assessment. This is very much still underway. Um, and another area where we coordinate quite closely with UNDP is also to uh, provide information and awareness through um, on issues related to housing, land and property. And this, of course, is part of a durable solutions, um, a long term sort of um, uh, solutions when it comes to Rohingya IDPs, because many of them have lost their land and have been encamped um, in, in uh, very, very dire conditions. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Jose, um, uh, as this would nicely link into UNDP's uh, presentation as well. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed a very difficult situation, and um, we want to follow Antonio Gramsci's uh, words, no? to be pessimist in the intellect, but optimist in the will. And uh, we want to find ways forward to cooperate, to coordinate, to make um, the best of this uh, very catastrophic situation. I had the, um, the luck of working for the Norwegian Refugee Council in Myanmar before uh, UNDP. So um, I was uh, uh, present in the, in the beginnings of the citizenship network with UNHCR, and, and it was actually a very good initiative that came up with very um, very interesting reports, such as the gender analysis on the right to a nationality in Myanmar that I posted in the website, 
And also there was cooperation with many local actors such as the Smile Foundation and, and other um, small group of, of yeah. NGOs that were working for uh, vulnerable groups in accessing um, civil documentation. But I think it's, it's important to understand that all previous problems that were present in Myanmar before the coup, not only for Rohingya populations, but for everybody else, and especially ethnic minority, uh, impoverished communities are still there. So every, every single problem that we had before uh, February 2021 is still present, and the conflict and the coup has exacerbated these problems and has created new ones. Uh, for example, having 2 million displaced persons, we have many people who seek temporary household lists, for example, because people are living in, in the houses of, of relatives no, in, in their displacement, and then they face these night checks. So you have the village administrator together with the police, they are checking in the middle of the night, really, no, who is sleeping where, and then they are check, checking this documentation that is important to, to, to have. So our, our CSO partners, and I will talk more about it in the, in the second part, are helping people uh, updating this, this household list. There is a, a huge issue, of course, in the legitimacy of, of the administrative bodies, no? the administrative bodies, including, of course, the immigration uh, department are very much paralyzed and more dysfunctional than than before to to put it in some way and civil society organizations are as a norm not willing to deal with them directly unless it is clearly uh, beneficial for the claimant or there is a prior relation with the official etc so we are navigating a very difficult environment where I will talk more about it later because this this question is more about coordination, but of an interim protection strategy. You know, having how do we work in the interim while we have the the institutions captured by the military? In apart from the citizenship network, I will mention also initiatives in Kachin to develop um, a joint action plan for what is being called the, the transitional solution sites. So that we have, of course, all the main uh, UN agencies, including UNHCR and civil society organizations trying to coordinate to see, okay, in, in which sites are we going to work? Are, are our civil society partners providing legal aid in these areas? Can we increase uh, assistance, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, I think in, in terms of, of coordination, I will just mention um, our communities of practice and just the, the activity of doing communities of practice in general. I think it's, it's a very good way to, to improve communication between UN agencies, INGOs, uh, civil society organizations, to build up also confidence, to discuss uh, this, this difficult uh, strategies and uh, and to move forward so i hand back to you martina uh thank you uh, thank you thank you so much and very very interesting uh, point and uh, reference to to coordinated uh, initiative uh, i will then uh, pass the floor to gabriele and shaza from uh, unitiar and hala uh, from undp uh, to share their experiences on syria uh, i know uh, being a facilitator is not always easy i will uh, kindly ask you to to try to to, to be straight to the point on on the good practices because otherwise we will not arrive to the section on question and answer which i think is very enriching and will give uh, the opportunity to the audience to to ask follow-up questions uh, so uh, please bear uh, the time limit if you can thank you Hey, um, I think I can start. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, uh, Gabriele Olivia, I'm Senior Legal Officer for the Country Office uh, in Syria. 
And I'm here with my colleague Shaza Hajali, who is an um, um, associate legal officer uh, as well, and um, um, I would say the historical historical memory of our legal aid program here in uh, uh, in Syria. Uh, we thought, uh, yeah, within the three, four minutes which has been given to us to try to give a bit of a background on the situation and why uh, UNHCR has decided to develop a quite uh, a large legal aid program uh, within the country. So in 2011, when the crisis started in the following uh, in the following years, um, UNHCR and uh, uh, along with other other actors uh, were able to identify in the lack of um, uh, documentation um, and uh, like identity do documentation one of the major challenges uh, uh, encountered by Syrian citizens in their display in this displacement uh, cycle. Uh, just to mention some 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 aspects. So, civil documentation is a prerequisite not only for to access basic services in Syria, but also uh, including government subsidies. But also to to is a prerequisite to access uh, HLP rights, for example. Um, during the, the first few years of the of the of the crisis, uh, about uh, twenty seven percent of the uh, judicial infrastructure and the cadastra department were fully destroyed. And about 50% of the uh, civil registries uh, department were either destroyed, uh, burned, or looted. Uh, and also due to quite uh, large uh, internal displacement, at the moment we have about 6 million internal displacement in, uh, in Syria, um, there was a limited uh, ability to reach the 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 the, the um, the, the civil affairs offices. And there was also fear from the IDPs to reach these uh, these uh, uh, civil registry offices, and also there was a limited financial capacity to uh, apply for for uh, uh, and secure documentation. In addition, there was also limited knowledge on the on the on the on the, the importance of having this documentation in order to access these uh, these rights. So when it comes to coordination, to say to respond to all these challenges, UNHCR um, started in, co in close coordination with all all, uh, all other UN uh, agencies uh, through the protection sector, uh, and also meeting uh, um, donor to discuss and uh, secure the needed uh, the needed support. In 2011, for the first time, in collaboration with other UN uh, agency and of course the the, the Syrian uh, with the. Uh, authorization of Syrian authorities, we succeeded to include the legal response uh, in the humanitarian response plan, and uh, uh, to obtain all the approvals from the from the uh, from the um, authorities in order to start our legal aid program. The legal aid program initially started with uh, several uh, national and international NGO uh, like uh, Syrian Women Union, uh, DRC, Triple uh, SD, and uh, and others, um, and they were mostly uh, cooperating and assisting, uh, providing legal aid in relation to uh, documentation, uh, and uh, and of course we're were uh, free of uh, of charge uh, at the UN at the UN level. Um, I would say that uh, um, a few uh, technical working group were created. One was a specific technical working group on civil documentation because, of course, this was consider was uh, uh, was 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 an issue at the moment um, uh, i have to say that this uh, working group is a bit uh, dormant but we still have the um, uh, technical working group on hlp which is uh, be, which has been recently um, revamped and i have to say which is um, quite uh, closely um, linked to the issue we are discussing today um, uh, the, the last point in terms of uh, coordination, I have to say that since 2015, uh, the major uh, the major implementing partner for our legal aid program are two NGOs, which are uh, Syria Trust and uh, and uh, and SARC. Um, and I have to say that unfortunately, uh, after 2018, we these were the only two um, national NGOs which were authorized to provide uh, legal aid. So this is the, the a quick uh, quick response to my um, to, to to the first point. Uh, over to to Hala. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, let me, allow me also to provide you with more kind of insights about the challenges that we are facing in the Syrian context, mainly on HLP uh, housing lands and property rights. Uh, Syria uh, historically we were let's say. Uh, uh, having 
facing inequalities in HLP, contributing as a driver for the conflict. And it was also a result of the conflict. And mass HLP loss and destruction, almost half of the country displaced and estimated around 27% of homes damaged and destroyed. This is even before the earthquake that uh, uh, early year hit Syria. So the HLP needs are massive. And as we know that HLP rights are essential component for rule of law. And but the problem that we have a limited space for UN agencies to work on on providing such support is limited. Uh, thanks to to the European Union, UNDP, UNHCR, UN Habitat, FAO, and NRC contributed to support the Syrians. First of all, to be, to better understand their HLP rights and to know how we can operate within this very complicated situation. And we have, a, we have start managing to see, let's say, seeking more to understand the situation and the magnitude of the problem within the degrees of HLP landscape. Uh, although this is the operational space is very restricted for, for us, the joint partners uh, managed <laughs> managed to come uh, together to build a cohesive approach to HLP problems and to develop a partnership among each other, building onto one another added value and areas of expertise in a joint program. Uh, we have better understanding of the situation, but also we managed to identify windows for opportunities to develop intervention and most importantly, how we can support the HLP people. Uh, we managed to, to position ourselves in it and to maintain a, a linkage with the key partners. And we have also an instrumental in developing innovative ways to work within the limited space. Uh, with, you know, uh, it, is, it is important for us to capitalize on such efforts, coordination, and must th this type of efforts must be maintained and fostered uh, to having not only to respond in a humanitarian context, but rather than to contribute to longer term objectives. And we need to keep our, our, our eye on, on the context that we are working on it to allow us uh, uh, how we can reflect it into our program. Uh, as for the, the kind of the partnership with the national actors, uh, I will return back to Gabriel so he can talking more uh, about the national actors. Over to you, Gabriel. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hala, and uh, thank you, Gabriele, uh, for uh, exploring uh, the uh, um, the challenges with us and also giving us a little bit of overview of uh, the uh, key initiative put in place in terms of uh, uh, coordination. We will now um, uh, um, take the opportunity to reflect upon another aspect of legal aid in crisis settings when protecting legal identity which is the aspect of partnership, uh, partnership with legal uh, aid actors, both uh, duty bearers and uh, national uh, civil society, uh, which we have heard already from our speaker in some uh, context uh, is uh, uh, very sensitive, is politicized and not easy. An aspect of protection of the operational space of civil society is actually key uh, to, uh, to uh, ensure sustainable sustainable legal aid and access to justice intervention. So I will give the floor again to Myanmar colleagues um, uh, to talk a bit about their challenges related to partnership. Uh, and uh, over to you, um, Jose. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, I think uh, as in Syria, that we, we can see that Civil society is, is a target, really. It's um, it's very much in the focus of the de facto authorities, and who have um, taken a variety of actions to restrict the the civic space. No, and probably the most important one is the is the registration law that was recently enacted, 
and which basically um, expands to um, to a very very much an acceptable degree the the discretion and the um, arbitrariness of the authorities in deciding who is a, a lawful uh, registered organization and, and who is not. And then it has a series of penalties that are absolutely disproportionate and which have put the, um, you know, the civil society organizations in a, in a dilemma because some of them, they keep their, their former registration, their former registration is still uh, valid, but many are uh, are facing the, the question, do I register under this uh, regime or do I not? And both uh, both decisions have have implications. And of course, it have it has implications also for the international community because um, financing a non registered organization is also sanctioned. And then there is a series of organizations that are banned by the by the junta and which uh, can also give rise to, to criminal penalties so what have we done uh, in this uh, in this situation and what we could call a, a best practice in some in some way is is for for us for un agencies uh, donors european union uh, australia and, and many others to get together and to discuss what can we do as a strategy to ensure uh, do no harm to civil society organizations, to protect the civil space, to fund non-registered organizations, to, um, to identify new forms of associations and, and registrations that are uh, very often very small, you know, but that are doing important important work, especially in areas where humanitarian uh, international actors cannot reach. No, and in terms of um, in terms of legal identity, uh, we are uh, UNDP is is supporting twenty civil society partners. Uh, half of them are on housing, land, and property rights, which is also a, a massive problem, as you can. Imagine we have uh, 50,000 houses destroyed. We have punitive uh, land confiscations against opposition members. We have um, all kind of uh, all kind of problems related to housing land and property. And of course, uh, civil documentation is uh, is essential. No, so what we are doing with them is, I will say that ensuring their survival. You know, so they. The, the strategy, more than being a, a legal aid strategy, which, which it also is, because we have to work on how to support uh, beneficiaries indirectly with less uh, contact with the junta authorities, but it's also a strategy to protect the civic, civic space. And that means reducing funding requirements, uh, reporting requirements, having a duty of care angle on civil society, uh, being as much, um, as nicer as, as we can be to, to build their confidence and to, you know, build their trust that we are behind them, we are going to share risks with them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I think uh, just to end this, this point, uh, we are, incredibly surprised by the ability of our civil society partners to actually deliver in this context because they actually come back and say yeah we've helped this person uh, or these uh, persons get their birth certificate because we've managed to circumvent the restrictions or we've helped uh, all of these people get some form of land registration or village administrators to uh, deal with the household list when there is a possibility with uh, to deal with and then there is the another issue which we haven't mentioned which is the institutions of the ethnic armed organizations and the people defense forces which is another uh, another area to explore because of course they control almost half of the country 
and and they are also uh, justice providers. But I stop here so not to cut others time. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Marsha and uh, Elisa. I don't know if you want to complement on the aspect of partnership, UNDP intervention, or shall we pass to serious speakers on this topic? Hi, Paula. Maybe I could share um, a little bit in terms of our good practice because this would lend um, nicely for uh, Shika's presentation later. Um, so, <laughs> in terms you. of no worries. In terms of sustainable partnership and national legal aid actors, um, as you know, um, it's it's a very challenging environment. There's uh, literally no rule of law here in Myanmar, um, and and accessing um, uh, partnership through justice actors through um, de facto authorities is uh, non-existent. Um, so very much when uh, we started to operationalize protection here in UNHCR, uh, one of our key priorities was um, access to civil documentation. And uh, in 2021, uh, we conducted a focus group discussion, uh, ensuring that it is a community approach and looking at a community participation in, in developing legal programming per se. Um, and um, this was done uh, in, in several locations, uh, looking at a holistic Rakhine approach. We didn't just look at the Rohingya community. We looked at Rohingya, we looked at um, uh, commands, and we also look at the Rakhine IDPs because there's always a perception that UNHCR supports only the Rohingyas. There's no um, support for Rakhines who were actually affected by um, conflict, by armed conflict. Um, so it was very important that we looked at the whole of Rakhine approach. And um, this was also a way where we could access our stakeholders, our legal stakeholders, to see how they, they had capacity to actually provide um, uh, legal awareness and legal aid to, to displaced and non-displaced communities. Um, the challenge, I think, with, um, with partners and capacity is more of the sensitivities of, of um, this area of, uh, as well, the 1982 um, law, and also because it's been under a military rule, the sensitivities were very, very grave. Um, I think partners found it a bit challenging and a bit, at first, a bit hesitant on how to approach this. Um, looking at the precarious protection environment, we've mentioned extortion, how to navigate extortion, how to have zero, to zero toler to tolerance and toler uh, policy in terms when it comes to extortion incidents. Um, it, 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 was, it was very, very, very challenging. Um, so we had to work very closely with partners um, as well to develop a bit more of a protection sensitive approach. Um, and and how to to give proper legal aid, legal awareness, and case management for Rohingyas as well. I won't go into depths of that because Shika will very nicely uh, share with you the challenges that they had to go through. But I think from UNHCR's per perspective, and what would be key to actually share um, here was more of um, UNHCR's moral and ethical dilemma when providing uh, access to to civil documentation and legal aid programming was that. The 1982 citizenship law effectively puts in um, discriminatory measures which denies Rohingyas the ability to self-identify. Um, they have to go through a process which they have to accept uh, being identified as Bengali, number one. And even if they are successfully um, um, obtain documentation as a prerequisite process to obtaining a civil documentation recognized by Myanmar law, um, it is always having a lesser right, less, lesser status. So in Myanmar, there's three different types of citizenship status, and the, um, the Rohingyas are presented with naturalized status, which, which really gives them a lesser right. So it was really a legal, uh, ethical challenge for, for, Rohingya, uh, for us here in UNHCR because are we promoting a system that is in, ineffectively discriminatory? Um, but I think what really came out through the community participation uh, assessments that we did was that Rohingya still wanted to understand why uh, it is important to obtain civil documentation, one, how does it support them, two, and also just wanted to know process and procedures to enable them to make an informed approach. And you will see here, um, um, base, it's a success that um, we started very small and ILF has been very, very amazing in how they have sort of um, uh, gone through barriers and challenges. 
um, but really um, communities just want to know what their rights are, how they can approach certain things, and even if it's challenging, make an informed decision. And that was a right that we gave to the communities, and that's how we overcome that moral um, and ethical dilemma. Um, and just very, very quickly, um, just speaking, I always speak about enabling environments because it's very important to have a sense of belonging. We also work again on social cohesion in initiatives with uh, another partner called ACTED. Um, and what ACTED does is actually work with youths on different activities um, uh, with different youths, Rohingyas, Kamans, uh, Hindus, um, just different communities. Um, IDPs and non-IDPs, what they do is they do soft activities like um, recreational activities, cleaning campaigns, volunteering, interfaith dialogues, and also livelihood initiatives just to ensure that there is the sense of belonging as well that complements access to civil documentation. Um, so just that from UNHCR's perspective in terms of a good practice and how we actually sort of uh, build, and capacity, uh, build, build our engagement with local partners. Um, and how we look at it a bit more holistically. Um, over to, um, back to you. Uh, thank you, thank you. That was uh, very interesting and thank you for, uh, for these inputs on, on partnership. Um, I'll uh, pass the floor to the uh, Syria case study. Um, so uh, please, Gabriele and, uh, and Shaza, over to you on uh, Syria, thanks. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so Syria, uh, UNITSA implemented in 2012 its um, legal aid program for uh, for a Syrian citizen. It used to be, situation has developed during the year, it used to be a legal program for refugees and then it turned uh, in 2012 mostly for, for IDPs, uh, of course also with refugees, but now our, our refugee population is really is really uh, shrink com compared to the past. So it's mostly focusing on uh, Syrian citizen, IDPs in particular, and it's uh, um, composed, if I may, of three pillars. So the first pillar is the, the legal aid program. Um, we have uh, um, the legal aid program is uh, implemented through uh, our uh, main uh, two main implementing partners at the moment, uh, which are SARC and Syria Trust. And I have to say that since 2018, uh, with the legal aid ban uh, in in Syria, these are the only two legal aid provider who are authorized to operate in the uh, in the in the country. Um, the program is uh, quite uh, quite uh, large. Uh, through this NGO, the, um, uh, operates about uh, 260 lawyers uh, and about 150 legal uh, outreach volunteers, covering the 14 uh, about 14 uh, um, uh, governorates, and they provide uh, counseling, uh, awareness session, but also uh, intervention uh, um, before administrative bodies as well as uh, uh, court intervention. Uh, the second pillar is the capacity building activities or rehabilitation activities so um uh, of course uh, is quite relevant in relation to to uh, legal identity the uh, civil registry offices and the cadastral department so uh, si since 2017 about 35 civil registry offices and uh, and other and some cadastral department has been uh, supported with minor minor uh, rehabilitation uh, activities we also support uh, in terms of uh, um, solar solar Solarization and also some uh, um, um, equipment, technical technical equipment, and, uh, and other items. The third pillar, if I may say, is the uh, advocacy for legal reform, and in particular, um, UNHCR during the year was uh, quite successful in uh, in having the government passing some uh, legislative uh, decree, uh, which uh, with the aim of waiving the fees and fine for uh, delaying uh, uh, delayed registration of civil events. There were at least uh, at least uh, six of them which were passed, uh, which uh, um, actually had a good uh, a good impact on the population and uh, in particular to the uh, for the IDPs to access documentation. Uh, part, um, uh, particular mention is uh, um, on, the, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, legislative decree 13 of 2000, 2021, which was amending the civil affair law and uh, instituting uh, something which is called the One Syria Civil Registry Office, uh, but uh, which is uh, which which will um, uh, which is basically is putting together 
together all the the, the database of uh, of each civil registry and uh, and uh, um, and so the uh, IDPs can uh, and uh, all see or or uh, every citizen in in reality can uh, register and uh, vital events in every part of the country regarding on on uh, regardless of they have their own uh, their own initial uh, record and at the same time they can abstract uh, civil documentation uh, uh, wherever they are located so in the in the country i've put here just one slide of what i consider to be some uh, uh, some uh, good practices um, of course the the, the number uh, that we uh, in uh, we reach uh, uh, yearly to our legal assistance which is quite uh, quite high uh, and through this uh, through this program um, um, we have uh, um, uh, you see the number of people who have managed to obtain uh, ID card this is directly through the our legal intervention uh, um, so uh, quite a large number in terms of id family booklets uh, and uh, marriage certificates uh, the second one is a kind of uh, also uh, in terms of capacity building as a result of this uh, rehabilitation office about um, uh, uh, one million seven hundred ninety thousand documentation uh, were issued by the civil registry. Um, of course, not all of this was because of the UNHCR rehabilitation support, but uh, uh, we have seen that in the year uh, an, an, an increase of this documentation been uh, been uh, been issued by the by the civil registry once uh, this uh, this uh, uh, the, the the civil registry offices were uh, rehabilitated and able to operate again. Uh, uh, one of the good practices which has Put it here is about uh, the the a mobile unit civil registry mobile unit which was donated by the unit to the minister of interior um, after um, many years actually because it quite, was quite complicated to put uh, together this mobile unit and to have the, all the clearances um, but now has been uh, donated to the ministry of uh, of uh, of interior and currently deployed in a hard to reach uh, location um, and finally also good practice as i say in relation to um, good result in terms of uh, legal reform um, in particular with the, one of the latest uh, uh, legislative decree which was in 24 of 2022. Um, this is, was a sort of amnesty which allowed uh, more than 200,000 uh, um, people to uh, benefit from this amnesty and uh, and have uh, uh, documentation being uh, issued. I spoke before about the, this one Syria uh, civil registry offices. Of course, uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, challenges which are still there. If we can move to the next uh, slide and we are trying to uh, address uh, 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 and uh, it's about the, the needs, which are indeed larger than our uh, legal aid capacity, especially now after after the earthquake, which has uh, hit the north uh, north of the country. Um, one challenge is uh, again the uh, the ban on legal aid provider um, units are they are only two authorized. Um, we are still uh, uh, trying to um, now advocating to uh, expand the number of uh, national international NGO who could uh, um, no, return to conduct these legal aid activities. Um, so this is indeed a, a challenge. And uh, of course, there are, there are some uh, red lines from uh, in relation to institutional support from the donors. Um, I mean, we uh, and, and different agencies have to say that they have different, uh, uh, if I may say so, different uh, different red line. When it comes, for example, to rehabilitation of uh, of, cert of certain um, uh, civil registry versus uh, uh, or cadastral department, uh, we 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 sometimes find um, um, the the donors uh, they are not completely uh, in line and not willing to find to fund certain uh, project. Uh, and of course, so we have. Uh, limited access to certain area and uh, especially in uh, in the northeast uh, in northeast syria we have uh, quite uh, a complicated uh, uh, legal system uh, which even the lawyer have uh, kind of struggling to understand which is the applicable uh, the applicable law at the moment so that this is uh, this is it for the time being from uh, from syria unless you i want to complement on something Thank you so much, Gabrielli. Hello, colleagues. Uh, I just want to elaborate a couple of points uh, to, in addition to what was mentioned uh, by Gabrielli. But before that, I just want to say hello to Dashel Shul uh, because I've just seen her name and it's been ages since we talked. So uh, I just want to say hello to Huda, who's, uh, who was the best uh, supervisor ever. 
we miss you in Syria. And uh, going back to the to the uh, and of course Stephanie, she's 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 here. I didn't see her name. Uh, I just want to say concerning partnership uh, with the government and the issues that was uh, has already been mentioned by Gabrielli. I just want to say that our partnership with the civil affairs uh, and immigration and others other institution uh, helped us to reach out to more beneficiaries to disseminate information on the laws, uh, legal reforms, as mentioned by Gabrielli, all the legal reforms that happened for the interest of our beneficiaries, IDPs and returnees, it was because of the uh, close working relation with the uh, relevant uh, public institution. Uh, we were also as well to measure the impact by getting regular statistics. We are able to reach out through the mobile teams. It's not only the mobile unit uh, that we recently established with civil affairs, but we're also able to convince civil affairs to uh, delegate their mobile teams to go to the areas where IDPs were displaced or where returnees are, uh, are uh, were helped to, be, to return, let's say, in collective shelters, etc., until they managed to go back to their original places. So this partnership and the close collaboration helped and had different dimensions that had a very positive impact on Syrian citizens. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Shaza, for and Gabriele. Uh, I think it's very informing, and uh, thank you so much for also reflecting with us uh, on the remaining challenges. Uh, I think a, a webinar on good practices in such difficult context could not actually uh, just focus on how we best work, but how we best try to work in a different uh, and very complex setting. Uh, over to Hala who will also share with us a good practice in terms of a partnership with a Bar Association before then looking at the third aspect. I will just ask you again to bear with the time to, to, to make sure that we have enough time for discussion. Thank you, Hala. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I will just uh, explain that, again, the space for providing legal aid in Syria is very limited. And as mentioned by Gabrielle in uh, 2018, NGOs were notified to suspend all legal activities conducted in Syria. So within the challenges of providing such support and mechanism to, to for people and with the restriction, we need to look for more innovative ways to, to address such a challenge. So therefore, we, we try to expand this space by launching uh, an online legal platform. This, uh, it is one of the, the first uh, virtual platform that is conducted by the Bar Association. And the challenge by itself that the this the restriction doesn't apply on the bar association, which give us the room to provide these services. Uh, and we worked on on having let's say providing legal services to all Syrians with different measures, regardless whether they are even inside Syria or even outside Syria. Uh, our platform called the Mustasharak al Qanuni, and it is provide more kind of information on national legislation rights allows beneficiaries to connect with the legal uh, professionals uh, and to to know more information about the the services and also what we've done the kind of establishing kind of referral services to other partners so to ensure that the the beneficiary will get the the whole whole side of of services uh, it is we try to uh, we've done our uh, it is a private it is confidential so people feel more secure about whenever they want to talk about their issues and it is also gender sensitive so with the the composition of the lawyers that are support providing these services we we made sure that is also we have a a, fem a female lawyer Another, another, let's say, uh, expanding the partnership. We work with the with the university, with the faculty of law, uh, and we have uh, trained uh, the fresh graduate uh, uh, lawyers uh, with the more kind of new issues uh, that is emerged during the crisis, and they've been the one who were being connected with the communities and having kind of awareness session for the for the affected <coughs> communities, mainly in around uh, five. Thousand uh, awareness session being conducted. 
finally as a, uh, also we worked with the um, on establishing or supporting the rehabilitation of civil service centers where we can provide the civil documentation for for the uh, communities uh, uh, it is mainly conducted at the administrative low with local authorities with the administrative with the municipalities to assure that even the the affected areas, they have access to their to their let's say basic documentation. And uh, by doing this, we 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 try to expand let's say the borders of such kind of restriction working in Syria. Over to you, Pal. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ali, and thank you for uh, diversifying for offering an overview of the div diversification of the partnership strategy. I think uh, that's very useful, and maybe other uh, representatives from other countries can also reflect upon uh, these opportunities with university bar association. Um, uh, so, going uh, directly to the third topic of the. the um, of the webinar today, which is the population hard to reach uh, uh, in Syria and in Myanmar, uh, even just the definition of hard to reach uh, is different. So I will kindly ask uh, the two uh, speakers uh, to give us an overview of uh, uh, their challenges in designing and implementing strategies aimed at tackling legal aid needs of hard to reach population, but me before also uh, giving us a little bit of context related to who are they are to reach and what are their vulnerabilities and risk and how the strategy uh, were put in place to overcome those uh, challenges. Uh, so for Myanmar, uh, first we have uh, Shika from uh, International Legal uh, Foundation. Thank you, Shika. Thanks, Paolo, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, my name is Shikha. I'm Asia Program Director of the International Legal Foundation. I'm here presenting on behalf of my team in Rakhine, who are still grappling with the after effects of the cyclone. Uh, in terms of, uh, so I'll just briefly introduce what we do and then the communities follow. And most of it has already been referred by Steph in her presentations. What she talked about, uh, Rohingya community, the IDBs, and various ethnic minorities, and that those communities is what we consider the hard to reach communities. So I'm going to just touch upon our interventions and how we have been working with these communities. So ILF is a legal aid organization, and it was established in Myanmar in 2017 with the goal of providing quality, holistic legal representation to people who are accused of crime. So our team of lawyers and social workers reach out to the most marginalized communities who are often criminalized as a result of lack of proof of their identity or status. And one such community is the is Rohingya community who are often prosecuted and sentenced with imprisonment for irregular movement. Our goal as a public defender office is creating uh, is, is providing quality legal aid, which is guided by performance standards for legal aid providers. And when we are talking about enabling environment to access justice and legal identity, we believe that having a committed legal aid office is the first steps towards that. And this was particularly significant in the context of Myanmar, because in Myanmar, legal aid law was enacted only in the year 2016. And the criminal justice system was still status quo, far being from fair or independent, considering the long political history of dictatorship. And unfortunately, as Jose has already mentioned, we are back to that situation and, uh, and, and under the current military regime. And in fact, most of, uh, in fact, in 2021, legal aid law was amended and stateless community has been removed from the law as people who are eligible for legal aid. And that is why it is so important to stress on the need, need of legal aid and legal aid uh, public defenders. So building strong legal aid system is a systemic process. And it starts with changing the mindset of the lawyers by creating space for brainstorming progressive legal strategies, providing support, resources, and training to cause lawyers. And through our work, what we have learned is that persistent and relentless advocacy with justice sector actors mm -hmm. is a step towards systemic change. And I want to explain this with two examples uh, that would also highlight on the good practice, challenges, and how we have been overcoming it. So, so far, ILF has represented more than 500 Rohingya men, women, and children who are prosecuted for illegal movement. Now, 
this comprises a staggering number of 59% of women and 35% of children, which shows that the pattern of trafficking amongst this community. In the courts, we challenge prosecution and conviction on the grounds like victims of trafficking cannot be prosecuted. Children should not be held responsible for not obtaining civil documents, blatant fair trial and due process violations, lack of access to lawyers, lack of translators. And we raise these grounds starting from the lowest court and we take them strategically to the high court and even the Supreme Court. Recently, ILA filed one of the first uh, motions in the Union Supreme Court on behalf of 70 Rohingya clients for violation of the Resident Registration Act. After thoroughly listening to the arguments presented by the lawyer on numerous procedural and legal violations, the judge simply responded that this is a political issue and the case was summarily dismissed. Now, as we know that in human rights litigation, legal victories will be scarce. But the importance of this litigation is to create awareness among justice sector actors, to document these violations, to present the challenges the community is facing before the courts and different forums. And the fact that this case was not dismissed on legal grounds also gives us a hope to continue litigating and challenging the legal process. The other example I wanted to give was from our Holistic Legal Aid Initiative, which we run in Rakhine with support of UNHCR wherein we provide support to the Rohingya and other IDB communities uh, to obtain birth certificates and other civil documents and registration documents. As already explained by Jose, Steph and Maria, that corruption is very pervasive uh, within the administrative authorities in Myanmar. But what we are learning through our, through our project is that persistent advocacy to oppose corrupt practices can also lead to change of mindsets. So in this example, the local health official had without any legal basis announced that children born prior to 2019 will not receive birth certificates in the year 2022. Now, these official orders were accepted widely as a norm, but it was not on any legal basis. So our team decided that they are going to challenge this at multiple administrative levels. So our lawyer in charge in Rakhine, she is a trained specialized juvenile justice lawyer. She took copies of the child rights law to the health department and advocated that the law does not create any exception for children to obtain their right to birth certificates and birth certi registration documents. Then after this, another official blamed the parents that they are lying. And this is what the stereotyping they are lying. They don't be, they haven't provided birth certificates, but they just want registration here. Then our team insisted that the department should verify and check the There's record to see if the birth standard. certificate has been has been issued or not. And in the alternative, they also gave a counter that if you do not trust the community, they are ready to give an affidavit, a test saying that they have not received birth certificate yet. Now, after overcoming this barrier, the child did not was not never issued uh, vaccine certificates. In Myanmar, vaccine certificate is the basis on which now we can get birth certificates because vaccine certificate act as a record that the child was born in the camp, in, in the IDP camp. And then we had to go back again and, uh, and through rummaging through the records uh, with the local nurse, it was found that the child was administered vaccine. And then there was another level of advocacy done by a team to get a vaccine certificate by advocating how important this document is for the child to be able to apply for birth certificates. After seven months of advocacy, we finally obtained birth certificate. And then after the birth certificate, we were, uh, we obtained vaccine certificate. And after vaccine certificate, we received birth certificate. But what is remarkable is here, a uh, remarkable achievement that the health worker uh, informed us that now they are open to provide birth certificates to all children who are fully vaccinated, which means the earlier embargo of 20, 2019 did, did not hold to anymore. And by way of which it was a far reaching impact on all the children who were born in the camp. So as an extension of a strategic litigation, as already mentioned by Jose, we also conduct community of practice with other legal aid organizations and CSOs, wherein we share experiences, discuss challenges, and find solutions collectively. Because as lawyers, it's a legal practice. We have to learn from each other. And com conducting communities of practice is, a, is another core part of our work, to learn from each other. 
Now, I just wanted to also touch upon how we are doing this work in such challenging legal and political environment. Now, considering that there's a great risk of legal aid being politicized in Myanmar, we have strategically maintained a very low profile. We do not talk, we do not mention about our work in social media and, uh, and how we publicize the service. We conduct direct outreach to the IDB communities by sharing flyers. Our team of lawyers, they visit courts every day and to identify detainees who do not have lawyers and connect them with service providers. Uh, we get information about mass arrests of Rohingya community on social media or through our local community networks and our lawyers immediately move to the police station to address that. So that's how we have been. We have been doing our publicizing our service on, on very ground level without talking about much on social media. And we have distanced ourselves from the political discourse in the country to not be identified with any political group. Secondly, we provide second strategy we have adopted is, and also this is our, our goal, that we will provide quality legal representation in every case for every client, for every community. And we do not work for any one particular community. So we are not a we are not an organization that provides legal aid only to growing a community. They are part one of our clients. To and this helps us to avoid being targeted or stereotyped. And this is also rooted in our belief that if you want to bring a systemic change, we have to push for progressive practice in every case. So what happens is that the judges in the court are so familiar with ILF lawyers activism because they argue a theft case as vehemently as a political case and this gives a legitimacy to legal aid organizations in such a challenging environment. Uh, lastly, I just want to briefly touch on the challenges. Uh, I think everybody has mentioned challenges are more or less the same. How to deal with the administration is, is very difficult and it takes a lot of long discussions and advocacy. But I wanted to highlight that the role of legal aid in conflict affected areas seems to be very under, underestimated. Humanitarian assistance should also include support to legal aid services, particularly for vulnerable populations. And in Myanmar, during the military coup and political crisis, we have seen how important the role of lawyers are because lawyers were acting as a resource for identification and documentation of human rights violations. They were the ones who had access to victims and detainees, channeling material support by connecting people in conflict with the law, in with social service providers. In fact, the military was uh, so adamant that they did not even give access to ICRC inside the prison. And th that is where these lawyers were performing such an important role. But their role has not has been that it is not recognized as much in, in, in conflict of areas. Secondly, as Jose has also mentioned, that legal aid across Myanmar needs more support, and especially in the light of the new organization registration law. And donors should be able to find a way to support legal efforts and, and initiative to ensure most hard to reach communities cannot, can, cannot be reached out until these organizations are supported. And uh, so, so making a requirement that registration documents should be should be there, it will is very impact would be impractical, and it will not be able to support most of the legal aid organized in Myanmar. And there has to be an alternative for that. And lastly, I that any support that is given to any initiative should be from a point of or from a long term goal instead of because the impact cannot be seen immediately. So, Paolo, that's all from my side, and uh, thank you. I, I think I exceed the time. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Sika. Uh, it was really very enriching. I hope for for the the entire uh, audience. Uh, definitely, you brought us uh, directly into the the core of the legal aid and access to justice uh, uh, program to uh, to serve the need of the one more uh, uh, hard to reach. So, thank you, thank you so much for that. And uh, without further delay, over to you, Laura uh, from NRC on uh, Syria. Thanks. Thank you, Paola, and good morning, good afternoon to you all. Uh, Laura Cunial, I work with NRC uh, on the Syria crisis, but I'm sitting in our regional office, uh, although I had the pleasure to work inside Syria for many years. But my perspective today is going to be a bit more holistic and more from a crisis regional uh, um, point of view rather than necessarily inside Syria. And I will touch upon three things from my side. 
first of all, a few words on the legal aid ban and, and the consequences, and then really looking at what are, in our perspective, the most vulnerable uh, group and the, really the hard to reach group. And then thirdly, uh, some experience and some lessons learned and good practice uh, from, from NRC uh, work uh, in the region. Uh, so going back to the legal aid ban, um, our colleagues from UNICR and UNDP already highlighted some of the challenges and the consequences that, uh, that we've seen by such a restricted number of legal aid provider inside Syria. Uh, NRC is not working fully fledged and we don't have our traditional information council legal assistance program, our ICLA program, because we also don't have authorization. But this is, I really would like to underscore something that is lacking also for many uh, very good and strong Syrian civil society organizations that were providing uh, very much needed legal aid on issues related to GBV, housing, land and property rights and legal identity pre-2018. And, and of course, the legal aid ban creates pockets of population that remain hard to reach because with only two partners being able to provide legal assistance, of course, you can appreciate the demand uh, in a country like Syria and, and therefore it's just not sufficient to, to be able to respond uh, to that. And, and, and it really limits uh, the environmental uh, of uh, legal aid in the country and also in general uh, the rule of law and strengthening access to justice, which as we know from our, our experience in NRC in other countries really can be strengthened when you have a plurality of legal actors, international, national, UN, uh, what have you, that are really coming in with technical um, legal services that are being provided to address uh, the various issues. So really underscoring again the need to continue to advocate for increasing the number of legal aid providers uh, in Syria or finding other ways to really strengthen uh, rule of law uh, and access uh, to justice. Um, now, looking at, at the hard to reach group and, and vulnerability, as I already said, uh, there is a group there as, as a consequences of the legal aid ban, but more from a a regional perspective and really looking at the Syria crisis as a protracted displacement where we have now Syrian displaced in all the continent across the world and, and where accessing to uh, civil documentation shouldn't be seen just as an individual need. For many documents you need to prove family lineage, you need to have permission from family members and when family members are scattered across uh, uh, the Middle East as well as Europe and other country, this becomes uh, very, very challenging. So uh, really, that's the perspective now in terms of the how to reach. Uh, and of course, the first group, uh, and we heard quite extensively on uh, the challenges related to dealing with status population uh, uh, by our colleagues in Myanmar, we should also not remember that there is a stateless population in Syria and we are dealing with a stateless or a risk of becoming stateless population also in the refugee response. So we have stateless Kurds currently residing in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And the majority of them uh, is originally from northeast Syria, uh, which is, as Gabriele said, also complicated in terms of uh, legal pluralism. And so really to reemphasize the fact that um, the lack of Syrian civil document remain a huge challenge for them, also uh, one abroad. And also, again, really uh, to reemphasize the fact that um, the status of being stateless is being passed to the next generation also uh, uh, in the case of uh, this stateless Kurds uh, community in KRI. Now, the second group really uh, of hard to reach a vulnerable individual are um, Syrian family with missing family members. Um, so we are dealing now with a very vulnerable group with very specific increased legal protection issue. And this is evident when our uh, legal team in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq are approached by widow or uh, female head of household who are dealing with the stigma of having a male family member missing in their family. 
and are trying to cope with their life and obtain uh, the civil documentation that they need to move on uh, with their life. So, for instance, women that want to get remarried and are not in a position to prove that their uh, husband died uh, because they are missing and uh, the process of declaring somebody missing has to start inside Syria. Uh, or that are struggling to obtain full custody of their children, again, because of the lack of this documentation that prove the status of being missing or a declaration of that in absentia, which can be obtained, but is a very complex uh, uh, and, and expensive process. And then also not able to deal with inheritance and other uh, obtaining other civil documentation and also vulnerable children that are not able to prove the connection with their father, the legal connection with their father, and therefore uh, are also at risk of uh, becoming statelessness or in general, for sure, of remaining undocumented uh, at the place of displacement. And of course, here you can appreciate really the gender perspective and how sensitive these cases are and how, uh, you know, there is a need to work across legal pathways between the host country as well as Syria. So these are really complex uh, legal procedure. And then the third group is uh, the group of family that needs to, conf that are confronted with the challenges of registering debt. Uh, and here I'm referring to people who have died in Syria during the war and were not properly uh, registered. So for which we have no proof of uh, uh, death and, and death registration or those who are, uh, you know, uh, dying in, in the host country. And I think access to civil documentation and in particular access to death registration is very much interlinked with housing, land and property rights. And I think this came quite strongly across many of the presentation today. But I was uh, in Jordan last week where, again, I had always uh, uh, the, um, the opportunity to meet some of our beneficiary and uh, uh, met this widow from the south of Syria who uh, would like to start an inheritance process uh, for her home back in Syria. Uh, and of course, she needs to have a number of civil documents. First of all, she needs to be able to prove who she is, so a legal identity, an ID card. She must have a marriage certificate to prove that she was legally married. And then more importantly, the death certificate for her late husband, so only after she has secured these three civil documents, she can start an inheritance process. Again, with family members displaced in over four countries in her case. So you can appreciate the number of power of attorney and other legal, uh, very complex procedure that has to be put in place just for her to start a process of uh, determining who can inherit the house that they left behind uh, in, uh, in Dara, in the south of Syria. So when you're dealing with these three uh, just alone um, groups of uh, hard to reach and vulnerable individual, um, a traditional legal aid program cannot respond. You know, it's not sufficient to uh, deal with the complexity of the cases and, 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 and procedure, as I said, that span across minimum two to three countries uh, and are quite complicated, quite expensive and time consuming. I think uh, in NRC, we're very fortunate that we have the largest legal aid provider in Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq, and when it comes to uh, legal identity for refugee, are uh, our own programming. So we are able to build on that. But of course, we really had to put measure in place that span across uh, different countries and really ensure collaboration between uh, lawyers who are sitting across uh, the border. So uh, in terms of best practice, uh, very briefly, of course, first of all, they need to carry out legal analysis that really looks at any new law uh, promulgated by the Syrian government and how this law apply to Syrian wherever they find themselves, not just in Syria, but also uh, in the refugee hosting country and see how much we can leverage, uh, you know, opportunity or where a uh, new law can uh, directly or indirectly continue to limit access to uh, legal identity documentation uh, for Syrian. And so, for instance, some of these waivers that have been mentioned as a success from our colleagues uh, in Syria, which indeed were removing fees and fines for late registration, in some cases also apply to Syrian outside of the country. So to see and abroad, but we really saw that there was no success there because unfortunately there is still quite a lot of fear of approaching Syrian authority, 
the embassy or even simply sending documentation back in Syria to family members. Uh, so we also saw really that uh, um, Syrian outside of the country were not able to benefit from this waiver. And also some of these waiver only related to civil documentation, fees and fine. Whereas, for instance, just by approaching the Syrian embassy in Amman or in Beirut require a minimum $50 registration fee per individual, which uh, you can appreciate is something completely uh, un 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 unaffordable uh, to the average uh, Syrian now um, in, in that we are dealing with. But then also really looking at uh, developing what we have called a co regional common scenario matrix. So understanding what are some of these um, group of vulnerability and what are the different vulnerability and how can we address them uh, so this is very much really a, a legal counseling and a legal assistance tool, how we can address them by operating across uh, the country where we have our colleagues in Damascus, our lawyer in Damascus, backing up non-Syrian lawyer in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq that are providing legal advice and really supporting refugee who have family member or have other means to access the documentation that they need in Syria and really working, as I said, across uh, legal pathways in uh, more than one country. And this is really all done with the main effort to ensure that uh, Syrians continue to access the documentation that they need. They don't remain uh, undocumented, but more importantly, uh, they don't resort to obtaining fraudulent document or forged document, which, by the way, we are seeing as a massive uh, uh, problem and as an increasing risk when Syrians are not able to obtain the document and they're not able really to, to work through the legal avenues to obtain this document. But let me stop here and very much looking forward to uh, the Q&A. Thank you and over to you, Paola. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you, Shika. And thank you for uh, the other panelists who have uh, really put a lot of effort in preparing the interven their interventions uh, today. Uh, um, I, I hope you can all uh, join me in thanking them because uh, the, the richness of their contribution uh, was really remarkable. Uh, so I would open now the floor uh, to the questions and answers. So please, if you want to raise your your hand um, uh, that would facilitate organizing the, the question. Don't be shy. And uh, uh, if you don't have any follow-up question for uh, the speakers on Syria and Myanmar, you are very also welcome to share uh, eventually good practices to uh, tackle common uh, challenges that we discussed today, among other uh, uh, access to population in need, politicization of legal aid, uh, difficult partnership with civil society actors uh, given uh, the, their uh, restricted uh, operational space um, and others uh, like legal aid ban and uh, uh, rehabilitation of infrastructure. Um, there is a question already in the chat uh, to the Syria panelists. I would say uh, the one that uh, are uh, more uh, focused on the inside Syria operation. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, Syria was able to fund the partnership with local administration for legal aid services like civil registration. Um, I would uh, refer back to Gabriele, Shaza and Hala, uh, whoever uh, wants to elaborate a little bit more on the partnership with uh, uh, local administration. Shaza, I can see your hand is raised, so please uh, over to you uh, uh, to respond to this question. Thanks. Sure, thank you so much. I just want to say that uh, civil affairs uh, registries, they work under the umbrella of uh, Ministry of Interior, uh, while the cadastral work under the administrative uh, MOLA. Like, uh, so, uh, yes, we managed to fund our projects with the civil affairs offices, but not like if we can say not funding, but it's about supporting projects that aim to restore the capacities of those uh, public institutions 
aiming to facilitate civil documents issuance for Syrian citizens, particularly, of course, IDPs and returnees. So uh, uh, there was some memorandum of understanding where we agreed to provide that support, uh, conditioned that uh, they will also, from their side, uh, issue more flexible procedures, more um, maybe law reform, legal reforms to ensure that uh, access is better, procedures are easier, etc. So, and of course, condition that they provide statistics on the impact of that support. So we regularly receive uh, from civil affairs statistics on number of individuals who were uh, for example, who were uh, granted ID card, family booklet, birth registration, birth certificates, etc. So yes, we managed to to get that support, but it's not funding. But we implement those projects either direct implementation or through uh, some implementing partners, national or international NGOs, who do the uh, capacity restoration. I hope I answered the question. Over. Just to, sorry, if I if I may just to complement and also um we, we, we also we also try to make sure that the institution is absolutely of a civilian character. Uh there has to be no link whatsoever with the with the security branches, I would say, or the or the army. Uh, so that's that's uh, kind of our uh, red, red line. That's why I would say that um, uh we were a bit uh, uh, skeptical when we receive requests to rehabilitate certain courts, for example. So um, we are looking to, for example, to certain Sharia courts. But yeah, we are still um, debating about the, the 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 necessity or the the opportunity to do so. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle and, uh, and Shaza. Uh, and thank you uh, to also uh, make the link to the, I would say, ethical and moral dilemma that also the colleagues from uh, Myanmar um, were, uh, were underlined. I think we, uh, again, we are talking about good practices, but we should not, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, forget that we are working in very difficult environment where each and every decision uh, is uh, uh, it's uh, it's difficult. It's very well thought, and has consequences on our staff and also, on, more importantly, on the beneficiaries that we serve. So, uh, thank you so much for um, for uh, highlighting that, uh, uh, Gabriele and Shaza. Uh, Hala, over to you uh, on, on I guess the the same point on the uh, partnership with the civil uh, administration. Thank you, Hala. Uh, thank you, Paula. Just for addition to what mentioned by and Gabrielle, uh, we are working with the, uh, as I mentioned, the municipality to establish a civil service center, where these, it's a not for the civil registration, rather than for obtaining, let's say, the documentation, wherever uh, the, the people are. So more increasing accessibility for the civil documentation. So this is where we, we, we are complementing what uh, UNHCR uh, are providing by, by expanding the outreach for, for communities and for vulnerable groups. For highlight, over. Um, thank you, Hala. Uh, that's uh, very great, and it uh, also brings uh, together uh, the point that um, uh, the uh, both uh, uh, Laura uh, and the colleagues uh, from uh, from Myanmar, in particular uh, Shika, was uh, uh, suggesting about a whole of population approach, either uh, to combat and fight discrimination uh, or to make sure that services are offered to uh, Syrians wherever they are. So independently of where the uh, family members are placed, I think that's another, uh, I would say, good practices uh, that emerge from this difficult context when uh, we have government and no government control uh, areas. Uh, I can see there is a, a question in the chat again for the for the Syrian colleagues. Um, is about Syrians residing in the north and the east Syria. Do they have the ability to obtain civil documentation, uh, which also includes, of course. Um, uh, uh, family booklet and uh, uh, identity card. I maybe uh, ask Laura uh, uh, to to comment on this point. Uh, thank you. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, well, the situation is fluid, of course, but that's that's doesn't come as a surprise, I'm sure, uh, because of course we know that in the northeast, uh, some um, government of Syria official uh, civil registry are functioning. Uh, but then, of course, some of the population is also present in area that is uh, under the control of the autonomous uh, administration, the self-administration. So, again, um, fluidity, I would say, is the answer in terms of which document can be accessed and where, uh, really, whether these are government of Syria official document or also some document issued by uh, the de facto uh, authority. Um, so so uh, that's from my side. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Laura. And I think you bring about also a topic that uh, for the sake of the time, we will not have the opportunity to explore further, but it could be the topic of another webinar. We had discussed that opportunity already with Martina and the colleagues of the task team, which is the challenges faced by uh, those who are actually issued governments, uh, sorry, uh, documents that are not issued by government, official government, but de facto authorities with different uh, uh, different nature. Uh, so that, of course, brings about issues of the legitimacy and risks for those population who uh, are maybe willing to return to their country of origin uh, with the documents that are not uh, recognized. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, stressing that aspect. Uh, Shaza, if you want to complement on uh, that point, I will then and pass to the to the other question from Fernando. Thank you, Shaza. Thank you so much. I'll just be quick because uh, myself, Gabrielli, and David, we went to Kamishli and we saw the situation there on the ground. So even if uh, the the um, the citizens there are not residing in government controlled area, they can easily reach the uh, the civil affairs. Of course, if they have no protection concern. So whoever has no protection concern they are capable to reach civil affairs offices and they are granted, of course, family booklet, ID cards, and they are registering their civil events as well. And this is also confirmed and reported through our lawyers who are functioning there. Of course, there are always some challenges here and there, difficulties, complications uh, when it comes to the uh, practice, the, wo the workload, etc., accessibility for the people residing in camps, etc. So, but in principle, uh, yes, as explained, there are some unofficial documents issued by the Kurds. However, uh, people who are able and feel comfortable to reach, they can, they can, they are able to obtain their uh, civil documents, the government ones that are recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Shaza, for uh, this in insight. Uh, I will uh, then uh, pass to the next uh, uh, question um, from Fernando. Um, I, and it's both for Syria and Myanmar, so I would uh, call on the Myanmar colleagues uh, just to have uh, alternative uh, uh, in, speak in speakers. Uh, so, um, uh, do the government in Syria and Myanmar, uh, are they considering using new technologies in their identification and civil registration system, for example, different forms of digital identity, biometrics, etc.? And if yes, uh, do uh, displaced persons and other vulnerable population uh, uh, have access to this technology or do they risk to be excluded? Um, I don't know if colleagues from Myanmar want to comment on that or is that not relevant for that context? And otherwise, uh, 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 Syria colleagues. Yes, Jose, over to you. Yes, I think it's a it's a very relevant point because Myanmar just before the coup had pursued the digitalization of its um, identification systems, and actually it almost uh, it was very close to getting support from the Austrian government and and the World Bank, you know. But the um, fortunately due to the discriminatory nature of the framework that aid uh, never never came um, however after the coup the de facto authorities have retaken this idea no of 
uh, digitalizing the system for the citizenship scrutiny cards. And I think it is a um, it is an important issue because it it really falls within a, a global trend towards uh, introducing digital ID or digital legal identification systems in developing countries. And in many cases, there is a real risk of involution. No, we saw that in Afghanistan. Uh, there is, of course, Myanmar, but there's also Sudan. There's other contexts where you introduce a, a, a technology that is can be very risky for mm. human rights, and then an involution, a coup, or mm. or any form of illiberal re regime comes. No, and it's also an issue in relation to the data of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. So, yeah, very very important question. At the moment, I don't think this uh, digitalization project is is really going anywhere, but um, it's something to keep an eye on. Over to Syria. Are there any panelists that want to comment on digitalization? Yes. Hala, uh, <laughs> no, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, just for clarification, uh, uh, working for us as a UN agencies with Syria, we are more working on on the local legal aid support. So support for the government and for the national institution. And unfortunately, this is under the red line that we cannot provide. It. So previously, previous to the crisis, yes, we were in a process of uh, digital uh, having more kind of uh, support for court digitalization uh, and as a, as a main component for access to justice uh, field. But currently, within the current situation, even if the government have the, the let's say, the willing and uh, a plan for it, unfortunately for us, it is within the red line that we cannot support. In, while it is expand, let's say, the people who can get the, the benefits. Over to Sheza. Thank you so much, my dear. Uh, concerning your CR and according to my, to, of course, to our information, civil affairs has already started the digitalization even prior to the war. However, during the war, of course, they faced lots of obstacles. And afterwards, because of the war and the consequences, losing lots of records, they resumed the digitalization and it's still ongoing. I assume most of the governance today are records, of course, are digitalized. However, we have, of course, some lost records maybe from the past prior to the crisis. And there are still some uh, government that uh, government areas, non-government controlled areas that still need additional work concerning digitalization. So the process started prior to the crisis and then it continued. And uh, today, as we hear from civil affairs uh, registry, it's mostly done except some areas where uh, there is no uh, proper control by the government. Uh, concerning ID cards, etc., there were some projects in the past to introduce a new version of ID uh, cards with more security features. However, as mentioned by Hala, due to the limited uh, financial capacity of the government, they suspended that project and kept it in two hours until further notice. Over. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, maybe just before passing the, the floor to you, uh, Laura, uh, and just to say that our colleague from uh, the United Nations Legal Identity Agenda uh, are here with us. And yesterday they organized a, a, a very interesting webinar on digitalization of legal identity with colleagues from the field, um, uh, uh, three uh, country cases studies were presenting their best practices uh, so we will try to make sure uh, to uh, actually um, uh, share uh, the recordings if possible of that meeting uh, because I think it speaks to our uh, conversation today. Uh, Laura over to you. Yes thank you Paula and very briefly again the perspective from inside outside Syria and uh, the government uh, launched, uh, I believe, last year, uh, some digital platform that are, can be used to register for applying for passport, uh, one for uh, whether inside Syria or outside Syria. 
Um, the uptake, uh, of course, passport for Syrian abroad is the most important document because it's the document that is being used to travel internationally. Um, so we heard quite a lot of rumor within the refugee community. However, uh, Payment can be made only by credit card, which again means that the vast majority of uh, refugees uh, were not able to benefit from this. And then more importantly, uh, the cost of the passport uh, for Syrian abroad uh, is uh, very high. Uh, for an expedite passport, the fee is $800. Uh, the Syrian passport for Syrian abroad remained the most expensive passport in the world. And for male Syrian in age of military conscription, it also has the shortest duration, two years. So uh, we see still that um, Syrian who are try uh, refugee, Syrian refugee who are, again, re refugee regional perspective, trying to obtain the passport, are sending family members or are using taxi or other brokers who are trying to apply for passport for them inside Syria and then bring the passport outside because this is uh, cheaper and seems to function uh, better than some of these other uh, digital initiatives. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Laura, and thanks for bringing the, the perspective of uh, Syrian abroad. Uh, we have uh, a few questions in the chat. Uh, I will uh, start from, in, uh, in the interest of this time, I will start from the third set of questions, um, which bring uh, to us a bit of a reflection about uh, the role that other actors can play to respond to the challenges that we discussed today. Uh, so, how can can academia and donor community further support legal aid uh, uh, programs to protect legal identity? And uh, uh, I think linked to that is quite interesting if you could reflect upon um, what are the knowledge gaps that you encounter in your current uh, practice, uh, which again speaks uh, to the partnership with uh, uh, academia and how can we further explore and how can donor actually support eventually these linkages between uh, uh, analysis, knowledge and uh, implementation of program. Who is um, from the, the panelists uh, uh, happy to, uh, to reflect upon on these questions, um, please raise your hand. Jose, uh, over to you. Yeah, I think it, it kind of goes back to the to the question of coordination. And I think uh, it's coordination, is, we should think about it in a broader, you know, not, not only this coordination meeting that we have in, in the countries, etc., but, but actually having the networks that include academia, that include civil society and abroad as well, no? And also to, to cooperate with academia in, in finding the right questions, right? What what kind of what kind of legal aid support can we provide under a military coup with EAO uh, <laughs> EAO is also controlling territory, et cetera, et cetera. Those are very good questions for for academics and it, it will give for very interesting research. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, um, Jose. Uh, I think uh, it's really interesting the point that you make about the need to uh, diversify the, the, even the definition of coordination, which uh, very often uh, relates to the in-country coordination. Of course, there are uh, countries uh, and contexts uh, uh, such as the one in Syria where uh, coordination outside inside be become even more difficult and maybe be there. I don't know if Syria uh, panelists want to reflect upon uh, the ask to donor, given that Gabriele also has uh, underlined, you know, the difficulties of working between uh, and uh, among uh, red lines. So thank you so much. But before uh, giving the floor to Syria on this hot potato, as we say in, a, in Italian question, um, maybe uh, Maria, uh, over to you on this aspect of uh, a, a partnership and coordination with academia and donor. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, I uh, will try to be very brief. Um, engagement with academia is very sensitive now, especially on issues related to access to legal identity, because the citizenship issues are 
already sensitive. Again, there are uh, many restrictions on uh, civil society organizations, and I think that also um, covers academia on engagement with international community, with international organizations, uh, which put, may put them at uh, risk. So um, uh, it's not easy to organize public events as we um, used to do um, in the past, um, bringing um, the um, academia students um, uh, for a um, big forum and discussed um, issues in public. Although uh, what we try to do, we still uh, keep in touch with some uh, professors and um, um, at, um, we um, engage academia um, to um, work on al analysis of um, Myanmar national legal framework um, uh, to compare it with, um, with international legal framework and uh, to work on a draft uh, model uh, citizenship law. Of course, we cannot use that um, model citizenship law right now um, as high level advocacy with the de facto officials is um, not possible at the moment, but we want to have it ready when the um, situation is conducive for uh, this, uh, this advocacy. Also, um, uh, at Rakhine level, um, our colleagues um, uh, engage very actively with students' union. Um, we uh, conduct sessions, awareness raising amongst uh, students, also uh, training sessions on um, various uh, protection um, topics, including um, access to citizenship and civil documentation. And we see the students' um, um, interest in um, these matters and hope they will uh, take these issues further um, when they um, graduate. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you, Maria, for this uh, for this input. And I can see um, uh, Atem Al Sufi from uh, the audience would like to contribute on this matter. So please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Paul and colleagues. Uh, this is Haytham from UNCR Yemen operation, and I just wanted to to share some of our uh, good experience in engaging academia. Um, we have a strategic partnership with a law center that sits uh, within a government university in the capital, Sana'a University, that we rely on for uh, protection analysis, legal analysis, um, capacity building for the authorities, as well as um, advocacy. Um, you know that it, we, are, we are in a context similar to Syria, so um, sometimes uh, having the analysis also in the research is not enough to do good, good advocacy and to be heard by the authorities. So having a renowned uh, law professors, um, a government institution that enjoys to some extent um, an autonomy and and uh, and a social and uh, standing in the community makes whatever they say heard, and it resonates with with the government, with the communities. So we rely on them also to pass these advocacy messages to the authorities, where um, where the the legitimacy of these messages will not be questioned. So this is one of the good practices that we are doing to engage academia. Um, also, we are engaging technical um, registration, uh, civil status uh, uh, documentation uh, staff in-house uh, that work within registration authorities, the registration authority in Yemen, to develop research and analysis on access to, to, to documentation. Now, the aim of this is to also build the ownership of the of the results of of such mapping and and and, and research, so that um, uh, such in, that the mandated uh, uh, authority to issue documentation would take ownership uh, of the findings that, that they reach with our guidance, because this is a joint exercise that we are doing with them. So I think those are good practices that that can uh, can can reach good results in a in a politically security sensitive situation. Over. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing uh, uh, good practices from from Yemen uh, on the linkages between uh, academia and the legal aid programming. I think uh, the, the point you 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 mentioned are very relevant for I imagine uh, in Myanmar and Syria and other contexts where the uh, the issue of citizenship and of recognition of legal and civil documentation uh, is key. Um, I can see Shaza from from Syria case study. Uh, uh, on the on this topic, and then uh, again, Jose. Thank you, Shaza. Thank you so much, my dear. I just want to uh, 
emphasis on what was mentioned by our colleague in Yemen about academia and their role in building capacity for staff in public institution. But I want to go back to the donor community and what can be done to make things better. I would say it would be good to encourage the donor community to pay more visits to the field where UNHCR and other agencies, of course, are, are serving, to be close to the ground, to see the real problems on the ground and to see the services provided. Because as we all know, always donors community have many red lines that they impose on us. And uh, since they have the budget that they need to give, we need them to be close to us to see the reality and to what extent we are able to make a difference and have an impact on the people's life. So also uh, having donor community more close, visiting more, as I said, the, the field, their presence as well in, in the, the countries where uh, the humanitarian agencies are functioning would help in the, our advocacy effort with the governments when they pay visit. They can also contribute to the advocacy efforts the, the agencies are, are putting to, to, to improve the people's life. And uh, as well, we need to encourage them or being close will reduce the, uh, the, the their uh, if we can say not to politicize the the the, the budgeting and uh, uh, donations they give so when they are closed they will be less politicized in their approaches i know we are not living in the ideal world but i think um, close and better coordination and being close to the field and to the people they will help them to be less politicized and less uh, with red lines if we can say that over Uh, thank you, thank you, Shaza. Uh, I think your your call is very much uh, uh, at the heart of all of those uh, work on legal aid and access to justice, and in general on uh, in humanitarian settings. Uh, please, Jose, uh, over to you. Yes, I just wanted to add in in terms of coordination and broadening broadening uh, collaboration in this context that we also have to look at digital safety. You know, digital. Digital awareness and digital safety uh, capacity building for for our CSO partners is very important, you know, because even today, um, for example, I shared uh, this Teams link with many organizations, and many they they are not they are just not used to to this particular platform, and maybe they are used to Zoom or to others, and of course there's no no translation, no no, which also is a barrier, no for yeah. for localization and yeah. then in terms of citi uh, citizenship uh, and academia there's an interesting project by the institute on statelessness and inclusion that i posted on on the chat reimagining the social contract and they have actually managed to do research in myanmar you know they had a, a webinar last week on on this topic and and i think that is uh, you know very remarkable and and I was just thinking, you know, on the issue of best practices in, in this type of context, maybe maybe what we can what we could do is move from the idea of identifying best practices to identifying best strategies, no? Because what we need is is really is really strategies to to deal with this um, to deal with these problems. Over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jose, and uh, it uh, also helps uh, uh, reflecting upon uh, uh, the results of this webinar, actually in the framework of the project, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, I maybe sh I should have said it at the beginning, we would like to uh, produce uh, a, a report of a, or a series of collection of reflection, I would say, on good uh, strategy, as you just uh, suggested, uh, maybe the title of the of the report. Uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to engage in this webinar now that the COVID uh, um, taught us how to do it in different countries, sitting in different offices. But I think it would be good to uh, to to reflect together how to make sure that this uh, knowledge stays and also, uh, uh, as you suggested, others. Uh, actually reach the one that are maybe hard to reach in terms of civil society organizations and practitioners uh, that are not uh, uh, 
either invited or cannot reach this uh, community of practice uh, uh, and exchanges. So thank you so much for this reflection and I will be very happy to engage further with the panelists and with the audience on ways in which the GPC uh, task team on law and policy can actually uh, follow up on all this material and reflection and make sure to 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 reach the one more in need also in terms of practitioners so thank you so much i'm very aware of the time um, I can see that there the has been already uh, quite an exchange in, in the chat uh, with the colleagues sharing, uh, sharing uh, good practices from Ethiopia and with the uh, colleagues from uh, uh, Unit CR and Protection Cluster in uh, Northwest Syria. So thank you so much for joining and also for sharing uh, the experience uh, from, from the field. Um, I would suggest that we uh, stop here. I don't know, Martin. Tina, if uh, you want uh, to uh, to add some closing remarks, uh, also on the follow up uh, to this event and to this uh, series of uh, learning seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paula, and, and all the speakers today. Really, like a, a brilliant session. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy, and I know that this is just the beginning of a conversation. We can still there are some remaining questions in the chat, but maybe you know, like Shika said earlier, like the idea that legal aid in conflict settings seems to be underestimated. I think uh, uh, this is this was the the, 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 the idea behind the, the project overall, really to to bring up to give the visibility to this work that it deserves because because it is absolutely central you know in the settings that uh, you're all working with as you have had today um, how how essential it is so i think that this is something that we will continue take forward as a task team please do reach out to us uh, i can include my my email in, in the chat or you can find it on our website of the task team page um and uh, the, the coach uh, you know please reach out if there is any a conversation that you would like to follow up with us on you know whether a uh, request that you may have uh, in this area or other experiences that you'd like to share we, we, we remain there to hear from you we, we will decide the topics of the next webinars as well to always trying to look at different contexts different practices so very much looking forward to hear from all of you uh, and thanks again for joining us today and uh, and I think that this is it um, so thanks again to all the speakers and we'll, we'll stay in touch Okay, have a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank everybody. you. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank, Thanks you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. The recording will be available. We'll make it available uh, on our website as well. Thanks. Bye. Bye. And Paula, maybe I'll leave as well and I just call you. But, but, but Mariana, you need to stop the recording, I think, to make sure that it is saved properly. I will um, uh, call you in a minute, uh, Martina. Yeah, just a sec. Yeah, bye, Paula. Just want to make sure.